good. Good afternoon, everyone. It's lovely to see you all on our last day of First Thought Talks uh, as part of the Galway International Arts Festival. You'll be wearing masks throughout, you're aware of that. Um, and uh, we are doing this program in conjunction with our partners, our education partners, for the festival, uh, NUIG. Now, we've got a wonderfully interesting woman to talk to you this afternoon, an Irish woman who was part of one of the most serious vaccine development programs, which, of course, the vaccine development program has been the uh, marvel of the, the world over the last two years and has probably saved numerous millions of lives. Um, Theresa Lamb was involved in the creation of the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine, which some of you, judging from your age, will have got, the same as myself. Um, and we were very happy to get it. And to talk to Teresa today, or to Tess, as she's uh, more commonly known, we have, we're very lucky to have Paul Cullen, who's the health editor of the Irish Times. He's worked at the Times since 1993. He was development correspondent from 1996 to 2003. And he has been one of the most informed, coherent, and useful of Irish writers on the COVID-19 pandemic. His piece has told us all the things we needed to know about the course of the virus, the measures being used to combat it, the progress of the vaccination program, the relationship between the government and NEFET, which of course has always been absolutely fascinating, and somebody will make a movie about it someday. We, we can guess who we might cast as Tony Holohan, and the toll taken in lives and long-term illness by a once-in-a-lifetime global event. We all badly needed the information we got from him. His was a steady, learned, truthful voice at a time when many of us were very frightened indeed. We're delighted to have him here today to talk to Professor Theresa Lamb. Please welcome Paul Cullen. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here in Galway and to be in NUIG um, and to talk to um, Dr. Theresa Lamb. Um, as you heard, uh, Theresa is an associate professor and she's a uh, principal investigator in the medical sciences division at the University of Oxford. She grew up in Nicholstown in County Kildare and she studied science at UCD. And she's there now. <laughs> um, she obtained a PhD at UCD and then she headed to Oxford in 2002 for her postdoc training. Um, and in 2009, she moved to the Jenner Institute, which is uh, devoted to the development of vaccines. And that turned out to be a very important move. Her experiences in zoonotic diseases, that's ones that transfer from, that can transfer from animals to, to humans and, and, and also in clinical trials. And she's worked on vaccines against some of the greatest scourges uh, to face mankind, be it e Ebola, influenza, Nipah, or MERS, which is also which is the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. And it was that work on MERS, another respiratory syndrome, which made her especially well qualified to begin work last year and very quickly on a vaccine for COVID-19 at the start of this pandemic. So back in January last year, she co-designed the new vaccine uh, before leading uh, the, the pivotal uh, preclinical studies that, uh, required, that were required to allow clinical trials to start in April last year. She was centrally involved in the clinical trials that followed overseeing the immunological assessment of vaccine responses and supporting the regulatory applications that had to be made later that year. So that now the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine has been shipped to over a billion people worldwide in such a short period of time, and it's played a pivotal role in the fight against the virus. So my pleasure to, to be able to talk to you today, uh, Tess. I mean, we're talking about, I mentioned a billion people, that's, that's really quite some number. Uh, and as I said, in, 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 in such a short time, and we forget, I think, sometimes how fast the world moved on this. Um, I have to say it's rare that I get the opportunity to say to somebody, we really wouldn't be here were it not for you and people like you, because we actually wouldn't be here. And it would be even better to have more people. We shortly will, probably. But I think that's true today. I just wanted to say, maybe just go back to the start of the pandemic. And um, I know from covering health and science that, you know, journalism... Uh, the media that we often cover it in terms of eureka moments, you know, like scientists jumping out of baths with it, having made discoveries or apples falling into your hand and so on. Um, did you have that kind of a moment yourself uh, at the very start back in January last year when you heard first about this mysterious <laughs> new virus in China? Um, I have to admit that my life has certainly not been full of eureka moments. Um, I think for most scientists working in the field, 
Um, it's an incremental slog. Uh, and this technology, while it's being, it's being seen as relatively new, a new tech, a new vaccine development program, I've been working on this ty these types of vaccines since I joined the Jenner, so in 2009, and that is building on decades of research that others have done before me. So while not a lot of these types of vaccines have been licensed, it's not that new. So there wasn't really a eureka moment. And what I remember of um, the end of 2019 and start of 2020 was, um, so my brother at that time was living in Shanghai and you'd occasionally hear about these little clusters of outbreaks. Normally they would be flu, so there'd be something to tickle your interest and you, you try and track those viral outbreaks. And particularly when you've got an Irish mammy asking you how your brother was going to cope with this, yeah. with these types of outbreaks. Um, so it was on my radar. And if you'd asked me back then what I thought the virus was going to be, I would have told you, I probably thought it was going to be a different type of flu, um, but I was wrong. So um, yeah, not so much, so many Eureka moments, because as I've said, this tech has been around for a long time and it's it's kind of standing on the shoulders of giants, to be fair. So you're really the, the, the right person at the right time, perhaps, and in the right place in Oxford? I think we, we so it's, it's, I wouldn't say the right person, it's the right people, the right environment. Um, I've been dedicated since I joined the Jenner on working on vaccines against emerging and outbreak pathogens. So um, if I take everybody back in the audience to 2013, 2014, there was an Ebola outbreak in Western Africa and everybody was very worried about that. And even before that, there was a 2009 flu outbreak. So what happened after the Ebola outbreak was that um, WHO and government agencies came together and they kind of made a, a hit list of the pathogens, the viruses that they thought might cause the next pandemic or epidemic. And within the university, we have lots of um, great tech available, lots of different types of vaccine platforms that we can use to make vaccines. So we took this hit list these known um, potential pandemic agents and try to make vaccines against most, if not all of them. But on there, the, in the, almost a small print was yeah. disease X. It was the unknown. It was the virus that we wouldn't know where it came from or when it would come. But we were trying to develop processes and um, put people in place as well that knew how to make vaccines against the unknown. So ha to have the right tech ready so that if it happened, we could go fast. And to be perfectly honest and blunt, um, when we got, so the information to make the vaccine, um, so I should almost take a little bit of a step back and explain how we sure. make these vaccines. Um, so when you're making a vaccine, what you want to do is you want to look at the pathogen, the thing that's gonna cause you sick, and you want to try and figure out what part of that pathogen, if you had a really strong immune response against it, would protect you would keep you safe. Yeah. So in, on, in January, I think it was January 10th, 11th, the information that I needed about the pathogen arrived in my inbox. And I took a tiny bit, a tiny bit of that information, and I stuck it into our vaccine, into our platform technology. So what happens when you get injected with the adenovirus vaccine, the AZ vaccine, the Oxford vaccine, is you get a tiny, tiny part of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus being expressed in your body. Yeah. Your body goes, what is this? And mounts a really strong immune response against it. So then if you were to come in contact with the real virus, the whole pathogen, your body would immediately recognize it. It's almost like training up an elite force of seals so that they can pounce and they can attack it and stop you from getting sick. So, um, we had the information um, in early January, and we didn't know then if we really needed to go fast, but we kind of took it as a training exercise, as a let's see how fast we can go in case this does explode and in case this does become a pandemic or epidemic. Were you confident that your technology would work, or did you really know that? Um, so this this is a slightly loaded question, so I'll, I'll answer it. Um, I was confident I could make a vaccine. Was I confident I could make a vaccine that would work? No, that's what we need clinical trials for. So we'd been working in the field, um, as you've, in, in, during your introduction, you mentioned MERS. And MERS is a, a relative of SARS-CoV-2. Yeah. 
And when we looked at the MERS virus and the SARS-CoV-2 virus, there's a tiny bit on the outside of these viruses, the spike protein. And the spike protein is what binds in your, to your cells in your body, and that's how it gets in. That's how it disseminates, that's how it makes you poorly. So if you can block that binding, you'll stop the virus getting in and you'll stop people getting sick. So what we've done with MERS was to take the recipe for this small part of the, the MERS coronavirus, the spike, stick it into our platform technology and induce a really strong immune response against the MERS spike. And we've seen in uh, preclinical models and in phase one clinical trials with this relative of SARS-CoV-2 that we were able to induce a strong immune response. So we took a very similar approach in early January we took the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2, we stuck it into our tech, our vaccine platform, and we made the vaccine. But we had to go through an awful lot of testing to see if it did work. Yeah, and I think there's probably two or, different, two or three different ways of making these vaccines, broad technologies that seem to have been proven to work by now, at least, aren't there? Uh, certainly two and maybe three, you can correct me. Um, why did you uh, go for one, the adenovirus one, as opposed to another? Or did you have, do you have greater confidence in, in the approach you were taking? Or was it just a matter that that's what your background was in? Yeah, so you've nailed it with the last. I can... yeah, yeah. So within the university, we have lots of different texts that you've touched on. So we have the kind of, they're seen as the older texts, the kind of inactivated vaccines or instead of taking the recipe for the spike and putting it into our platform, sometimes you can just make it. So you can stick the spike protein into your arm and that can tickle up the immune system. But really what we had expertise in um, was the adenovirus tech. And we, we've been working on it. So I've been working on it since 2009. Sarah, Adrian and Andy have been working on it cumulatively for decades. So we knew how to do this. And the advantage of this tech is that it can go fast. So it can go faster than some of the older techs. You can make it quickly. So from getting that sequence and making our first vaccine batch that could go into animals, not GMP, not to go into humans, it was about a month. Yeah. So that's pretty quick to make a vaccine. And some of the older techs, you can't go as fast. Those vaccines are coming onto the market now, so they're yeah. kind of inactivated vaccines. And there's a place for all of these vaccines because there's no one vaccine is going to do the world. There are different ways to skin the cat. So, exactly. So then in the early days of last year, at the start of the pandemic, you're, you're describing... So you said almost for an intellectual exercise, let's try this. Um, and you wouldn't have had any money, really, particularly no. for it. <laughs> but then things changed, of course. The size of the pandemic, it spread all around the world and people were dying in serious numbers and it became the number one, the only topic in town, obviously, political pressure came in, but funding came in as well. But then I imagine, I mean, you've, you've talked about how hard you, your team had to work, you, you, you and the others. I mean, you must have started, it, like the, the nature of the challenge changed fundamentally, I think, uh, probably then. Yes, you had uh, doors open for you, funding, you didn't have to worry about those things, but you're under tremendous pressure, um, work pressure and other types of pressure too, weren't you? Um, yes and no. Um, so you're absolutely right. There was no money at the beginning. I remember at the very, very start, myself and um, Sarah having conversations about how we would order the ingredients that we needed to make this vaccine. And we're talking about minuscule amounts in the grand scheme of things like a thousand pounds or a couple of thousand. And there wasn't funding available to do that. But we ended up scraping the bottom of the barrel and getting some money together and, and going. Um, when you ask me about the pressure, there was never an external pressure or I didn't feel like there was an external pressure put on me. I was, um, this is going to sound a little odd, but I was lucky. I was in a position that I could do something to help, or at least we thought we could do something yeah. that could help. We could make a vaccine that could potentially help us out of the pandemic. So the pressure to deliver, the pressure to work relentlessly, the pressure where you don't see families, you don't sleep, you don't eat properly, that was all, we did that to ourselves. It wasn't like there was an external pressure put on. We didn't need it. <laughs> there was, we knew we had a chance to do something 
Uh, we didn't know if it would work, but if we could do something to help get us out of this pandemic, yeah, we just had to do it. It wasn't a choice. And what I what I what I picked up from the accounts that you've given and other some of your colleagues as well, you were all you're all just ordinary people, really. Yeah. You've got jobs, mortgages, families, and so on. You've laundry to put out at night, families, holidays to arrange, mundane health issues got mentioned in various things. So it's very far away from the kind of high-tech corporate image we have of pharma and the you know hazmat suits and so on it's it's really quite humanizing i suppose really um yes there was one point during you're absolutely correct um i've never experienced anything like this in my life uh, not that i want to again um but at the very beginning when we were kind of trying to deliver the clinical trials the logistics of trying to get this off the ground there was just so many moving parts. So, for example, um, we have trained individuals who can do certain types of work, certain assays. Um, and we were trying to contingency plan that if one team got infected, how would we test the vaccine? So we almost had to have people in different groups and then house them together in case they got infected. And this is when things were just getting discovered about the virus. And it was a part where we ended up with we we sorted accommodation for these teams of remarkable individuals that you know moved out of their accommodation to move into new housing so that we could keep them together and safe so that we could keep testing the vaccine but they didn't have a washing machine so we didn't know how to wash their clothes so those types of yeah, yeah we're very normal people who need clean clothes and food to keep going and I, I was also struck as well that I didn't realize there's quite a degree of job insecurity in in the careers of uh, around drug development and so on because a lot of short-term contracts and and sometimes it seems to be a lure to take a maybe you've done it I'm not sure to take a fixed job because it gives you the security to allow you to pay the mortgage and, and raise a family instead of relying on three-year tranches of funding is that is that the case is that your experience? absolutely um yeah. it's a it's a very difficult career a career in academia is um it's not without its ups, but also its downs. I've been in the university, as you said, since 2002, I think. Um, and I've never had a contract, have I? I think the longest contract that I've had with guaranteed funding was three, four years. Yeah. I've had contracts for three months. Um, it makes getting a mortgage quite difficult. Luckily, my partner has a, a, a stable income and a, a good position. Um, I'm hoping that I don't put young people off this career, but I do think there is something to be said about um, investing in people, not necessarily um, investing in places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So tell me, you, you, you developed your vaccine. The comparisons also made is compared to making bread or baking bread or making cakes. Just tell us a little bit about that process. Sure. Yeah. So. Um, I'll get a little bit technical, so please do interrupt if I, I get too technical. <laughs> um, so our um, platform technology, our vaccine backbone, is based on an adenovirus. And everybody in the audience, and you and I, will have been exposed to adenoviruses. And there are things that cause a common cold, a bit of a, a runny nose, sore throat, throat etc. Um, so we know that they can induce an immune response. Now, the disadvantage of using adenoviruses is pretty much in what I've said. We've all been exposed to them, so we've all got an immunity towards these colds. That's why we don't get so sick. So adenoviruses are a great tech. They're a great, great way to kind of make a vaccine. But because you've got an immunity towards them, we've used a different type of adenovirus that most of us won't have seen, an adenovirus from a chimpanzee. So not a lot of the people in the audience will regularly play with monkeys or chimpanzees. So we won't have an immunity towards those. And what we do is we take the um, coding sequence or the recipe for the very small part of the SARS-CoV-2, the spike protein, and we stick it into the adenovirus. And then when we inject you with the adenovirus into your arm, your body sees it as an invading pathogen, something that it needs to clear. So it mounts a really strong immune response. And at the same time, you've given your body the recipe, the instructions to make this tiny, tiny part of SARS-CoV-2, the spike. 
So your body's getting ready to attack. It sees this invading pathogen. It sees this spike protein that it doesn't recognize. And you train up your immune system. And the immune system um, can be split very broadly into B cells and T cells. And B cells provide antibodies. And they clamp onto the outside of the virus and stop it getting in. And T cells then come along and can recognize cells that the um, virus has got into and kill them. So it's a double whammy. It's a double-edged sword. Um, and the recipe for making these types of vaccines, these adenoviruses, is incredibly complex. So even if I was to give you the instructions, it's a bit like um, Great British Bake Off when you, you give the, all the contestants all the ingredients and the instructions but what comes out at the end can look very, very different. So you do need a level of training and a, a level of equipment and expertise to make the vaccines to the to the right level. To go right. Into yeah, things. yeah, I would trust me. Um, <laughs> tell me of this. Then you got the trial results. I mean, was that the high point of, of this experience? How did you feel when you know, because they were they were very good to say the least. Yeah. Um, so actually, just before getting the trial results, we'd obviously um, heard, as the whole world has heard, about the trial results from Moderna and Pfizer. Yeah, and actually, that, first time. that was a real high for me, yeah. which uh, because it meant we could make a vaccine. And if that meant we could make a vaccine, that means we can make lots of vaccines, and then we can make vaccines that will get around the world. So... Um, what did, how did I feel when I heard the results of our trial? So we've been working on all these assays to measure the antibodies and the T cells. We had broken our back um, trying to get the samples to the right places to do the testing as well. And it, it had been a horrific um, period of time. And I have to say that it was just huge. It was monumental. It was a feeling of relief, a feeling of... Um, happiness, a feeling that we'd achieved something, and um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you had created this baby, uh, so to speak, in Oxford, stamped with, you know, the brand of Oxford, the team that were working there. But of course, that had to be scaled up. You didn't have a pharmaceutical factory that could produce millions of jewels. So what started as the Oxford vaccine became Oxford AstraZeneca, then in shorthand became AstraZeneca, AZ. Um, having created that baby, did you then have to say goodbye to the baby then or, you know, because, or, and, and lose control of that process that you had tightly for, in the early months of last year? And how did that feel? Um, so, I, so when you're mentioning that, I'm, I'm thinking about my 13-year-old going off to college and how I'll feel exactly. like uh, then. Yeah. Um, no, that's how I imagined it would happen. Um, I, I obviously, yeah, so the, the university negotiated the deal with AZ, but everybody um, around the table and at the table were very clear that this was a vaccine that was not for profit, that we wanted this vaccine to go to low and middle income countries, and AZ were fully on board with, they, with all of that. Was that a condition of, of their partnership then, that they would buy into? It, it wasn't a difficult condition, it was really? something that they wholly bought into, yes, absolutely. Um, I personally thought once I'd, once I'd heard that we had, um, not that we'd handed it over, but that we had this deal, that my life would get a lot easier, mm. that I would end up speaking with these individuals, helping them out, and that they would take over the running. And they have. They've taken up the manufacturer. They've taken over the, the scale up. They've taken over a lot of the regulatory, um, basically the paperwork to get the vaccine approved. But the relationship hasn't ended. Um, we talk to AstraZeneca, I'd say, almost daily. Um, it's very much a partnership. We work together um, on progressing the vaccine and testing it in different ways, like testing it for third doses, et cetera. Um, so it's really been a, a really good collaboration, a really good marriage. There have been ups and downs, but there wouldn't be if it wasn't a normal marriage. Um, but I have to say that I have made some lifelong friends in AstraZeneca that I could pick up the phone now and ring them and know that they'd be yeah. there for me. And, and where did the impetus come to make this a kind of a democratic product that would be available at cost price around the world? Um, 
did it come from within the scientific body or the university or and, and is it is it somewhat disappointing that it hasn't been applied uh, or it hasn't worked out that way with some of the other products that are around um so i'm going to be a little bit difficult and almost reverse that question and say how can you make a vaccine that isn't available all around the world. This, this isn't a problem unique to any one country. Mm. We need to vaccinate the world or we're not all, none of us are safe. So <clears throat> focusing on just getting one country vaccinated is very um, insular and myopic. And we, we need to take our heads off and look around and look at what's happening globally. And it's only when we are all safe does this actually, can we consider that this pandemic is over? And I, I know that in a lot of countries, um, restrictions are easing, but they're not easing everywhere. The, this pandemic is raging in other mm. countries. So it, it's natural to me. This, this should never... It's, I work on vaccines against pathogens that have impact globally and in low- and middle-income countries, and it, it just... Yeah. It's intuitive. Yeah. And, of course, um, in this middle part of the life of the vaccine, Things got a bit bumpy, it's, true, it's fair to say. There were issues around trials and dosing regimes, um, rare side effects. I mean, at times it seemed that uh, your vaccine, your baby again, had become a political football. Um, did that dent your sense of achievement and how did you cope with that uh, part of the experience? Particularly, as I say, it had probably gone beyond your direct control now because it was a global product. So um, did it dent my pride in what we'd managed to do and continue to do? I don't think it did dent mine or the teams. And I, I have to stress that it's a global team. We've got partners in the US, Brazil, South Africa, Australia, everywhere that helped deliver this vaccine. It's not a Oxford-based or UK-based vaccine. It's a global endeavor. Um, so I don't think it did dent my pride in what we'd achieved. Um, this vaccine has been, it's being made available in over 170 countries. It's um, about half the supply to COVAX, and COVAX is an initiative of WHO and Gavi to get vaccines to where they're needed in low- and middle-income countries. It's over half, nearly 70% of the supply of AstraZeneca is going to low- and middle-income countries. So when you look at those facts, when you consider those things, then we're doing what we set out to. Has it been a bumpy ride? Yes, it's been a roller coaster. Um, and some of the um, reporting, generally um, social media, generally um, fake news, has been difficult to um, deal with. So, for example, when we started our clinical trial in April last year, we had two volunteers. One volunteer got a placebo. So that's an irrelevant vaccine, the men ACWY vaccine. And then one of them got our vaccine. And they didn't know which one they got. But what they did wake up to the next morning was fake news that one of them had died and that one of them had died because they'd been vaccinated with our vaccine, which was utter nonsense. Do you ever find out um, where that, that report came from? Or? I'm not aware. Um, yeah. But that spread like wildfire, so much so that the participant, she had to go on national TV and say, no, I'm still alive. That doesn't spread as much. Mm -hmm. um, and we've also had stories saying that if you get in, injected with the AstraZeneca vaccine, you'll turn into a monkey. And again, that spread like wildfire. Yeah. And I think actually maybe if I was to criticise me um, in particular, because I feel like I can do that, um, I don't know that I took these stories seriously enough. I took them personally, and they obviously had an impact. But I didn't come out and say, that's silly. Don't don't believe that. Because it seems obvious to me that you wouldn't believe that. And I think I didn't really realize the impact of communicating effectively and being um, almost not aggressive, but coming out and saying, no, that's nonsense. Ask me any of the questions you want to ask me. And how important that was in the early days. Were you able to cope with this? I mean, you're obviously thrust into the limelight to an extraordinary extent uh, compared to your, any time in your previous career. Um, I mean, were you given any training for it or by the um, university, for example? 
and um, not for quite a while. And I think at that stage, I'd either have sunk or swim by then. Um, so, okay. and and to be to be fair, um, Paul, I never considered myself a very good communicator, and I don't know if I put the weight that was needed on how you need to communicate your science. Because back when I was um, when I was before the pandemic, I kind of thought that the results and the data they'd speak for themselves. Yeah. You don't need to explain it, but really you do. You need to stand up and you need to be able to explain, well, this data says this, and this means this. And if you can't do that, it doesn't matter how brilliant your invention or your science is, because it won't get to the people who need it and they won't understand. And it's about building up a trust and a dialogue and answering questions that people who are vaccine hesitant may have so that we can build up a relationship and build up a trust in a rapport. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and obviously there's a particular aspect to this, um, not just involving you, but you're an Irish woman working in Oxford. And at, at times it seemed to us here in Ireland that the Oxford uh, vaccine was going to be branded with a, a union jack on it. It was very, the British government seemed to be promoting it as a, our invention, and it was a post-Brexit world, obviously, and, and there was a lot of emphasis on that. How did that make you feel, I think, you and, and others in, who were Irish in the team? Um, it was interesting. Um, <laughs> there are, um, so I don't know how, so we have teams in Brazil that work with us. We have teams in South Africa that work with us. And without those clinical trials, we wouldn't have been able to test the vaccine. Um, the people who designed this vaccine, only one of them was British. The people, the kind of lead PIs, there's there's more diversity. There's more, um, there's across the board, there's a mixture of gender, race, um, ethnicity. Um, so I don't, I don't see this as a British vaccine. It never was, and it never has been. Um, yes, it was developed from Britain, because that's where we're based, but it's not a British vaccine. It's a global vaccine, and it has to have global reach. And without our global partners, we wouldn't have had this vaccine. It's, it sounds a bit like the 18-year-old uh, British winner of the US Tennis Open there recently, isn't it? Uh, quite the mix. Um, you, I, I have a quote from you. You said at one stage, science is not about getting everything right all of the time, or even most of the time. It's about learning from what went wrong and figuring out why. Um, to be a great scientist, you need a little inspiration, but a lot of grit and determination. So I'm just wondering, based on the experience of the last 18 months, what do you think you got right and uh, what went wrong along the way and, and, and what have you learned from this experience? Sure. Um, so that quote, it, it, it's specifically, um, well, it's not specifically, I, I will talk about what we've got wrong and what we've got right, in my opinion. But um, I do want to focus a little bit on um, science and why getting it wrong and failing is more important than getting it right. Because I, I think there's a perception that you have to be a brain box to come into science, and you really don't. You have to be able to take the highs with the lows, and you have to be able to knock when you get knocked down, you have to be able to get back up. And if you've got that, then you can be a great scientist. So when you come into science, when you're working in a field, when you're trying to answer a question, you'll have an idea about when you do an experiment, how it will work, what will happen. And hopefully the experiment will work and hopefully you'll get an answer. But a lot of the time it doesn't. And then what you have to do is you have to take a step back. You have to look at the experiment, the test. You have to figure out why it didn't work. Hmm. And why, when you're figuring out why it didn't work, you're actually really understanding all the nuances or how things interact, why A uh, cause B cause C. And in doing that, that's where your knowledge comes from. So in fact, when students come in and their experiment works first time, I don't congratulate them. I actually say, well, it'll never work again and yeah. you won't learn anything. So you're better off failing so that you can really learn from your mistakes and it also makes you when your experiments work and when you're trying to test if two plus two makes four sometimes it will come out as five and then you have to go back and reassess rethink and that's how you learn just proving yourself right all the time it's not fun who wants that you need to be able to challenge yourself and um, but to answer your question specifically what are the lessons that um 
I've learned uh, personally through this journey um, and what are the mistakes that I've made. Um, so I always knew teamwork was important, but I've never appreciated teamwork so much as I have across the last 18 months because without this huge group of people all working with a common goal, we wouldn't have been able to make a vaccine. Um, I've learned that communication is very important and that's probably where I failed. I didn't give it enough. I didn't pay enough attention to it in the first part. And, and to an extent, I, I need to cut, cut myself a little bit of slack and the team. So when these false news reports would come in or false news on social media, we were in the middle of delivering this vaccine. We had to keep going and get on with what we were doing. And we couldn't necessarily be distracted with all of it. But I don't think we paid enough attention to the impact it was having on the program and us ultimately being able to deliver what we wanted to yeah. deliver. Um, so that was a steep learning curve. Yeah. I don't know if I've answered your question. No, no, you have. Um, so, I mean, you were the girl asking, back in school, you were the girl asking questions in biology class back in, in school in, in Kildare, where it was a cross and passion college in Kildare. Um, so how did that girl end up in Oxford designing a vaccine for the world? Were you always destined for this kind of work or, you know, a lot of people wonder how how things materialize yeah. in their thing or we, we, was it just a series of accidents that led you there or was it, were you driven by an early passion for science? Well, I was definitely driven by an early passion for science, but some yeah. people would say nosiness. Um, I always like to figure out Sent how things work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, I was always inquisitive. I always liked figuring out how things work, why one thing causes the next thing and so on. Um, I remember my poor biology teacher in secondary school um, avoiding my hand when it used to go up on occasion because I'd ask a question as anybody would, but then I'd ask another and another and another. And that's kind of how my career has gone. I just kept following the things that I felt interested in. Um, and when I transitioned from my kind of earlier career in, um, so when I started my postdoc studies, I was studying autoimmunity. And autoimmunity is when your body doesn't recognize itself um, and it thinks it's a pathogen, so it attacks itself. So for example, rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, that's where your body thinks, you know, your joints are actually, I don't know, a virus or a bacteria and it tries to attack it. Sure. Um, so I was really interested in doing that type of work, but I wasn't seeing as big an impact because it wasn't getting translated. So then I moved into the next natural trajectory for me, which was over here to um, uh, to make vaccines and to see that translational kind of impact of vaccines. And I have to say that back then and for many, many years, vaccines were not interested. People were not interested in them. They were almost seen as a dead science. Yeah because they're an invisible shield. You don't appreciate them until they're gone or they're not there. And people don't tend to appreciate that. They appreciate the paracetamol or the aspirin or the therapeutic that will stop the hurt there and then. And they don't appreciate the kind of cozy cardigan that's keeping you warm that you don't know that you're wearing. Yeah, yeah, and your moment has come. And tell me, was the move to England a natural progression or was it um, something that was, uh, forced upon you by a lack of opportunities in Ireland? Um, so it is very important within the scientific field to get um, basically to move, to get exposed to different ideas, different people, different cultures. Actually, that's not, that's true of any kind of field, to be fair. Um, I'd always wanted to spend some time away from home and then ideally return home. Um, and in 2002, I was offered a position in Oxford. It was a great opportunity um, working on a new type of technology and in a field that was new to me, but has been my bread and butter for the last number of decades. Um, so it was a great opportunity I couldn't turn down. So I moved over here in 2002. Um, I, I think within Ireland, um, the infrastructure to um, deliver what, has been delivered across the last 18 months is probably not quite there yet, um, but it's certainly better than it was when I was leaving. And could you ever see yourself coming back to Ireland? Um, well, I'm an eternal optimist, and um, there was definitely a, a point 
uh, in my career where I, I just had my first child and the pull of home was very strong. Um, and we looked to move, but then I got offered a great position here as well. So it's, um, yes, but if there's anyone in the audience who wants somebody for a sabbatical or to come back for a couple of months, I'm, I'm open to invitation. Sure, and I, I will take some questions from the audience now in just a moment, but um, it, it is remarkable, it seems remarkable to me anyway, that um, so many of the people involved in your, in your effort have been women scientists, very senior women scientists. Now, having said that, I note your comment by your, your colleague Sarah Gilbert on this issue, and she said, she responded, she said, this is 2020, why are we even discussing women scientists? I'm a scientist, not a woman scientist. So anyway, um, there I go. This is my sheepish way of asking the question. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, clearly, well, in my opinion, and you can dis dispute it, but I think it is, uh, and I, listen, I, I studied engineering in my day, and there might have been 5% uh, uh, girls in the class when we were starting college, you know? And I don't think it's that much better in some of the sciences. Um, so, I mean, it's, uh, from, to my eyes, it's been, uh, very important to see that kind of balance, uh, gender balance in the whole narrative around science and the pandemic. So uh, what's your take on that? So as is often the way I agree and disagree with Sarah in equal measure. Um, and that's yeah. why we're good friends and good colleagues and that's why we yeah. work so well together. So I completely agree that I do not define myself as a female scientist. I'm a scientist, full stop, that's yeah. it. Um, but I'm lucky because um, uh, granted I'm a first, um, well, I'm one of the first generations of my family to go to university. I'm certainly the first one to have, been, to have gotten a DPhil, et cetera. So I've been very lucky with having a very supportive family and a supportive environment. And there is still an awful lot to be done, in my opinion, to give that level of support to underrepresented minorities and um, cohorts of the population who don't get supported quite as well. Um, and we, we definitely need, and I think this, there's a big drive within Oxford, I sit on some of the um, kind of graduate studies admissions, to diversify and to encourage and to support. And do I think we're doing enough? No. Do I think we've more to do? Yes. Um, but should we drop the mantle and pretend like everything is equal? Absolutely not. We need to keep going and pushing this. And we need to encourage um, not just women, but uh, all underrepresented, uh, underrepresented minorities. Um, and we need to promote them. And we need to make, the science isn't scary. You don't have to be a brain box to do it. You just have to be determined. You find a question you're interested in and you just have to be stubborn. And Irish people are quite good at being stubborn and so are girls, so you know. Um, I don't understand the, uh, the lack of diversity. And do you think that could be achieved uh, or should be achieved through quotas or reserved places or should a purely meritocratic system apply? I think you need a mixture. I don't think there's one system that's going to fix everything because, to be honest, Paul, if there was one system that was going to fix it, then we'd be there already. Um, I think we need to... Um, encourage people to be confident and to try new things and not to be afraid to fail. Um, and it's okay for you to get things wrong and that's how you learn. There's a preoccupation, I think, within um, education systems that you need to get, you need to ace every test and you need to be a high flyer all the way through and that doesn't work for everybody. Sure, sure. Would anyone in the audience like to ask Tess a question? See a man in the front there. I think you're going to get a microphone given to you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Thanks for an excellent discussion about the whole thing in terms that we can understand. Um, but I think you mentioned about communications. I don't think the onus should be on the scientist to worry about communications that uh, as part of the team maybe maybe you're saying it, it's, the problem is not you it's that there should be uh, as much emphasis on the communications in the things as on the knowledge and the science and the development of the, the product 
so uh, <laughs> I don't think you can blame yourself for the communications industry. See what's happening in the States. They haven't got the communications right, right at all. Like The other second question I want to ask, and it's just two questions, that's all. Uh, people who are immunocompromised, and there's a lot of them out there, I have a daughter myself who is, and uh, is, is there anything that can be developed in terms of the vaccines that can be specifically directed at the immunocompromised? For, for example, if a person has Addison's disease or some of these kind of things, uh, they are worrying an awful lot more about this uh, virus than all the rest of us, and we don't seem to care. Like In their eyes, we don't seem to care about this immunocompromised business. That's it. And That's thank you for an excellent uh, discussion. So I'll start with a very sincere thank you for saying that I could explain things that you could understand. So that, that, that'll that top my day off. Um, I do, um, yes, so it would be great if there was a set number of people that could go out and explain the science to the public. Um, we're academics, we're in a university, we don't have a PR team to help us. We do have a public advisory division um, and they they do help us where they can and I have a good friend there now, um, but they don't, they can't do, there isn't enough people basically, so it was up to the scientists who go out and communicate. Um, the immunocompromised question, um, they, these are, so, I would hate for you to think that we're not thinking about immunocompromised people and that we're, we're not trying to test and ensure that our vaccine or other vaccines or other therapeutics can't be used in these large group of people. It's not just one type of condition. We've, um, when I say we, it's not just me, there's a number of groups all around the UK that are looking at different types of vaccination regimes and different types of immunocompromised people. <clears throat> so for example, you can have immunocompromisation with HIV, you can have them with kidney transplants, and you can have them with Addison's disease and others. And there's lots of active and ongoing trials to test and see how the vaccines are working in, in these types of people. It's difficult because by their nature, they're immunocompromised, so they don't generally induce a strong immune response as an individual that doesn't have these conditions. They're being advised to get a third dose. Um, I would agree with that. Um, I don't know that I necessarily agree with rolling out boosters en masse within countries where you've got high vaccine coverage because there are countries where there's been no vaccine that, you know, healthcare workers have no protection afforded by vaccines. Um, so it's, it's difficult. The, the question of boosters en masse to me is a difficult one, but for immunocompromised and people with waning immunity, yes, I think they should get a third shot. There's also therapeutics that are being developed that will help if uh, these people are to get poorly, then they can be used. So while the vaccines are first in front in most people's minds, there are an awful lot of therapies that are now available that weren't available that can help these people if they do get poorly. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if I've answered. I think you have. I think, of course, we forget that there are some people who can't take vaccines, of course. Yes, right. absolutely yeah. agree. Yeah. And, and there's, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, anyone else for the question? Um, We've got one in the back there. Yeah, question. Uh, Tez, thanks for an amazing talk. Really wonderful. Um, so this is a question about just looking a few years ahead. And I just wonder if you could cast your eyes forward for us. And where do you think this virus, from a scientific point of view, is heading? You know, what's the sort of trajectory look like? And then what do you think, you know, will be the world of vaccines ahead of us? Um, I'd be interested in your views on that. Thank you. That's a great question, and it gets me onto one of my swan songs, and I can I can do it legitimately without having to grandstand. Um, so the first part is relatively easy. I think this vax, this virus is going to become endemic. Um, we will learn to live with this this virus, and it won't be as um, uh, as difficult to live with in the years to come. It's still very difficult to live with in lots of countries, including Africa. Um, so my swan song is about how much we've learned 
and it's a collective learning and how much all of us have sacrificed. And I'm going to say something that might sound a bit depressing, but it's, it's there will be another pandemic. I've already talked about outbreaks of other viruses that I, and I've just touched on them. There's an, there's an outbreak going ongoing at the moment in Africa of a Marburg virus. Now, it doesn't spread very far. It's not as transmissible as SARS-CoV-2. But we've seen throughout human history that pandemics happen, epidemics happen. And we've amassed so much knowledge that instead of reinventing the rule book, we need to be in a position where we can just reignite what we've been doing and to keep it going in the background so that we don't lose all this knowledge, that all the sacrifices that all these people have made, it's not just me and the team here, but across the healthcare service, across therapeutics, across frontline healthcare workers, that that doesn't, that we don't forget. And there's an awful lot that we've learned. There's an awful lot of best practice that we can do for the next pandemic that hopefully, you know, will mean that our grandchildren or our children are in a better position to go, to go fastly and that they don't have to start, that they have a head start in defeating the next pandemic. So I, I'm very concerned that, and this is uh, true of everyone, that we're looking to the future and we're looking to get out of this pandemic and we're not focusing enough, on my opinion, on using the knowledge that we've amassed to better prepare us going forward. Um, so I hope that there are some uh, government bodies listening, but uh, unfortunately I'm not one of them, so. Sure. Can I just ask uh, one thing I'm not clear on? Um, are you developing a, a tweak of the Oxford vaccine for the Delta variant? And would that require fresh trials and regulatory approval? Um, so we um, are at the moment testing a, it's not the Delta variant, it's, um, it's mm -hmm. called AZD 12, 2816. Um, and it does, it's designed against a different variant. And we're looking to see, and these are trials that are being run by AstraZeneca, um, but we're taking part in helping them um, to see what the immune response is like with a different variant vaccine. So, um, and we're also, so what we've done and we've just put some of the results out is look to see what three doses of the original vaccine, what that does. So to see if we, after two doses, can we boost the immunity with a third dose? And does that push the antibodies that might be there um, higher um, to a level that it causes neutralization of variants? Mm. Now, We've shown that, and we've shown that a third dose does that. Um, but I also have to say that um, I don't know. So if you look at the vaccine effectiveness data, it's not all about neutralizing antibodies, because even when the level of these neutralizing antibodies, these antibodies that stick to the outside of the virus and don't let it get in, even when they're low, we're still seeing really good protection against hospitalization and death. Why is in that? Yeah, so that's the million dollar question. Okay. I think it's a combination of lots of different types of immune responses. So, yeah. and, and we're being myopic and just focusing on one. Um, and people are um, very concerned when they see the number of cases going up. But the chart that I look at is the number of deaths and hospitalizations. Sure. So I'm probably Great. going to ca cause offense with what I'm going to say, but. I don't really care if you get a bit of a runny nose or a tickly cough. Yeah. I want to protect our most vulnerable, our most elderly, our people who are most at risk from dying. Yeah. And that to me is where we should focus our vaccine. And that's what a vaccine should do. Great if it can stop transmission, great if it can stop you from getting a tickly cough. But we need vaccines to keep people alive. That's, that's their purpose in my mind. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's a point yeah. I've been trying to make uh, in, in, when I write about this uh, for, for months now. That the real indices, of, the way of measuring the impact is, is about serious illness and hospitalization, ICU death and so on. But one question that is put back, uh, thrown back at me and when I do that is what about long COVID? And do we, do we have any idea whether the vaccines have any impact on, on preventing or minimizing long COVID. I know it's not very well defined, it's new and people are struggling to, to, to put a definition on it, but um, it's certainly uh, something that's worrying a lot of people. 
as you can understand. Yes, so I will preface this by saying this is not my area of expertise, yeah. but I will offer you what I can remember around this area that I've read. Um, so to my mind, long COVID at the moment is a collection of different types of reactions after having this particular disease or a viral infection. And in fact, what can happen is that after you've had a viral infection, not SARS-CoV-2, other viral infections, you can get poorly through other mechanisms. So, but we don't have a name for it. So for example, you can get, develop a condition um, such as reactive arthritis. And I know about that because my son had it after he got a, a, a sore throat, a viral infection. Um, so I think long COVID is a mix of different symptoms and it's a mixture of different types of disease, if that makes sense. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I have seen data published recently looking at the incidence of long COVID in children. And obviously that's one of the areas of um, worry and certainly was an area of worry for me at the very beginning that because most respiratory pathogens, they um, will impact the young and the old. Um, and so when I was coming into work in March, I was really worried that I'd bring it back to my children. Anyway, I digress. Sorry, the data suggests that the um, percentage of children getting after 16 weeks after they've had COVID, that there's a minimal difference in individuals that didn't have COVID developing long COVID. So there does seem to be a lot of children who are going on to develop long COVID. There is some evidence to the best of my recollection, to suggest that vaccines do impact positively um, long COVID. Yeah, that's, I've seen that data. Anyone else with a question? Um, yes, plenty of interest here. Yeah. Again, thank you for a fascinating talk. Um, I was just wondering, earlier on, um, in the early months of the vaccine, there were perceived supply issues, particularly in the EU. I'm just wondering, was that, is, is the adenovirus cultured and was that kind of the rate limiting step or was there any particular reason for that? And if so, has the issue been dealt with, whatever it was? Um, absolutely. So the first part that I will say was um, I'm not a vaccine manufacturer and obviously it was AZ that was dealing with the supply, but I can make an analogy here. And it was, um, so if I give, and I've, I've made this already, I can give a number of people a recipe of how to make bread or pizza or a cake. And you can give them the ingredients and you can give them the best ingredients and the best starting materials to make vaccines or bread. And what comes out at the end can vary. And it takes a certain amount of time to get the knowledge um, and the process is right so that you can always make perfect bread or perfect vaccine all the time. Um, and it, it's it's not the same as, I don't know, um, yeah, I, I was going to say it's not the same as printing an ink cartridge, but I imagine there's an awful lot of expertise in that as well. So I won't say that. Um, it's a biological process. It does take time to get it right. Um, and we were definitely doing our utmost to try and get as many partners to make this vaccine to the high quality that is needed to roll it out. We've partnered with Serum Institute, um, which is a Serum Institute in India, and they're the largest vaccine manufacturers in the world. And they are churning out millions of doses a week. Um, but it does take an amount of time to get everybody up to a level and the processes up to a level. So um, it was definitely unfortunate that um, that happened. And, and we will, we will wrap up shortly, but how is um, the vaccine, your vaccine, holding up now on the latest uh, effectiveness figures and so on? It's, it's doing reasonably well, isn't it? And there, there is a kind of a, I saw in some suggestions, some studies that the longer time goes on, maybe the, the more robust its performance is. Is that, is that the case? Well, I, I think it's doing awesome. <laughs> um, but that's because, yeah, I'll be slightly biased. That's not an Oxford I, word. <laughs> um, I, so there are studies coming out of Canada, there's studies uh, coming out of the UK, um, demonstrating that the effectiveness of, actually, to be fair, I have to say they're all doing awesome, there's no, uh, the effectiveness of the RNA text and the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine, protecting against um, alpha 
delta and the original, they're really high and it's, it's, they're protecting older adults as well. Uh, um, so the population, the part of the population that we were really focused on protecting along with the immunocompromised. Um, so to me, that's the kind of data that we need to keep looking at. We need to keep focusing on the effectiveness wow. of these vaccines against all these different types of variants and if they're keeping them. So sorry, the data I'm talking about is keeping people out of hospital. I'm not talking about infection rates. I'm, I'm talking about people out of hospital and seriously ill and, and death. Yeah, and, uh, and you did mention the possibility of another um, disease X coming along or another pandemic, but just within the scope of this one, what do you see the risk of a new variant coming along? And we've had two which have knocked us for six in the, within the last 12 months, obviously. Uh, is there anything worrying on the horizon there that, that you know about that we don't yet know about? So to be um, absolutely blunt, it's, it's not, there will be another pandemic. So um, we need to be in the best place we can be to protect our population and protect the world. And we're not doing enough in low and middle income countries in Africa, in my opinion. Um, as to horizon scanning for this particular um, pandemic, I think we're going to continuously see new variants. Um, I've yet to see any data about a variant that has worried me when it's come to effectiveness against hospitalization and death. And that's what we need to keep focusing on. That's fascinating. Um, Unless we have another question, I'm, I'm proposing to stop. Um, Tess, I don't think you need to worry about your communication skills. Uh, <laughs> I think you might give Mike Ryan a run for his money, in fact. Um, you might be angling for his job, maybe, at some stage in the future. Um, I'm a huge fan of Mike Ryan, so. <laughs> um, listen, I thought that was fascinating uh, and humanising as well. I think it's brilliant to be able to put human faces on, on, on science, scientific endeavour. Um, as I said, I think uh, you have given a masterclass in explaining in simple terms the complex process involved in creating a vaccine. But of course, we're all, we're all very highly educated now after this pandemic, at least. And I'm struck by, you know, I do try and look, at, especially over the last 18 months, I do try and look on the bright side of things. And there are many positives, aren't there, to come out of this. I mean, there's the emphasis on science. Uh, there are the people who are delivering that science and how prominent they are. Um, the fact that you you did all these development processes uh, at the same time rather than stage after, and so you know, the fact that we have another platform, as you say, for, to to increase our preparedness for what might be an, another pandemic some way down the line, and of course, greater awareness of the possibility of that. So, um, so I'd like to take uh, on behalf of the audience to say thank thank you very much. Um, my only regret is that you're not in the studio here with us in Galway. But uh, I hear maybe next maybe next year, if you're if you're nice to the organisers, they might bring you back. <laughs> I'd love to. I'm a huge Pixies fan, and I've, yeah, I've heard a rumour that they're playing next year. So yeah, I'd love to be there next year. Uh, I'll go too. Thank you very much, Jeff. <laughs> Bye. Thank you very much for lovely interview. Um, consider it done, both of you. Okay, we're off. <laughs> uh, you'll be at the Pixies concert next year, Tess. You are awesome. Uh, everything Paul said is true. It's fantastic that we're getting uh, such a, a brilliant set of people at first thought to tell us about science, about the pandemic, about responses to it. This morning already we've had Professor Abe Pandit giving us vast amounts of information about possible, uh, really hopeful outcomes from the learnings that Tess has described to us. Um, from the, the pandemic. There are still tickets left for Mike Ryan at six o'clock. If any of you would like to come along again then to see him. Uh, and just remember that all of these talks will be going on the GIAF YouTube channel tomorrow. So if you think you've forgotten some of the wonderful information you got today, you can go and look at the whole thing again and look at three fantastic shows just from today, three events that will add to your um, immense education already about the pandemic. I want you all to thank Paul Cullen, who did such a wonderful job preparing for this uh, and um, had such a fruitful and interesting conversation with Tess Lamb. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.